like to welcome you all to Gumtree Presbyterian Church to worship our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ this morning. It's good to see members and visitors alike here this morning. Uh, glad we've got a big crowd here. And we'll say good morning to everybody out there on the internet also. Don't forget y'all. So uh, this morning we're going to stand and worship him by singing Come Behold the Wonders and Mysteries. So let's all stand together and worship our Savior. I want to welcome you as we come together to worship the Lord uh, this morning. Um, our family has been to Pennsylvania and back this past week, and I realized that I was going to just, you know, welcome y'all and be, tell you I was glad to be back, and I realized we were here last Sunday. Um, but it seems like we've been gone a long time, but uh, I, I bring you greetings from Julie's parents, uh, and we had a great time with them, and we we're reminded again, as I'm sure several of y'all that have been traveling on crowded highways, that our lives are in God's hands and God is merciful. So uh, we're thankful for that. Um, we do have several announcements. Uh, we will have the Lord's Supper next Sunday. And so I would just encourage you uh, next Sunday morning to uh, be in preparation uh, for that. Uh, we'll be part of our morning service uh, next Sunday. We are uh, going to have a Thanksgiving Christmas potluck supper. Uh, that will also, uh, that will be on uh, December 5th, next Sunday at 6 p.m. Uh, and so I would just encourage you to come and, and be a part of that. We are thankful that we can uh, 
in God's mercy, eat together again. And so uh, if you are feeling at all comfortable with that, please come. And if you're not completely comfortable with that, we will make arrangements for you. There will be, <clears throat> there will be several different rooms, um, and there might even be outside seating. So uh, we'll put you in the parking lot, but please uh, come and, uh, and be a part of that meal next Sunday night. <clears throat> also, we would love for someone to volunteer to be a Sunday school teacher floating sub. And what that would mean probably is you would have to have one or two, possibly three lessons that are your favorite lessons and, and have them kind of prepared. <clears throat> and what you would then be uh, ready if someone was sick on a Sunday morning <clears throat> we could just call you and say hey we're gonna need you for the adult class or hey we're gonna need you for the college class or we might need you for the high school class those three would be one sub uh, and that way th those are the same type of teaching uh, and then if another person wanted to volunteer for the younger classes uh, to be, uh, again, you'd have a lesson or two, <clears throat> your own lesson, kind of prepared, <clears throat> and that way uh, we, could have, uh, we could have somebody just kind of lined up, uh, because obviously we, we have all those classes covered, and I've got teachers faithfully teaching them, but people do get sick, and sometimes it's at the last minute, and so we would, uh, we would love for somebody, a couple somebodies, to, to volunteer to, to fill that need. Are there other announcements that need to be made this morning? <clears throat> Again, I welcome you. I would welcome <clears throat> your attention to Romans 5, verses 7 and 8. Uh, let's meditate on God's word and ask him to continue to prepare our hearts to worship him this morning. The call to worship for this morning is also from Romans 5, uh, the verses surrounding uh, the verses we just read, <clears throat> starting in verse 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we exult in hope of the glory of God. And not only this, but we also exult in our Tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance proven character, and proven character hope, and hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. For while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good man someone would dare even to die, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, 
but we also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now have received the reconciliation. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this section of scripture that reminds us of the great reasons that we have to gather here this morning uh, to worship you, that you would demonstrate your love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, you would allow Christ, God the Son, the perfect one, to die for us. Uh, and that you would justify us and declare us righteous because of Christ. And that you would allow us to approach your throne even now and find it a throne of mercy and, and grace and help. Again, because of Christ. And so God, we gather here this morning called by you to this place <clears throat> to worship you. And God, I pray that you would work in my heart and in each of our hearts, God, I pray you would soften our hearts, that you would direct our attention uh, to who you are and, and what you have done. Uh, and God, I pray you would cause us to worship you this morning in ways that are pleasing and honoring uh, to you. We commit this worship service to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to stand as we sing hymn 379, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. week in the Westminster Shorter Catechism, we're going to be moving into a discussion of the fifth commandment, and we're actually going to be looking at questions 63 and 64. So question 63 is, which is the fifth commandment? And the answer comes to us from Exodus 20 and verse 12, of course. The fifth commandment is, honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Now, question 64 is, what is required in the fifth commandment? And if we could bring that one up, it may help if you uh, read along with me. Now remember, before we read it, our, our principle of interpretation that we're using as we approach the Ten Commandments, that God's eternal moral law is summarily comprehended to us through the Ten Commandments, and that each of the Ten Commandments are like subject headings 
beneath which could be written all that God's word says about a certain area of life. So the answer that we're given is the fifth commandment requireth the preserving the honor and per performing the duties belonging to everyone in their several places and relations as superiors, inferiors, or equals. The fifth commandment requires the preserving the honor and the performing the duties belonging to everyone in their several places and relations as superiors, inferiors, or equals. In other words, the fifth commandment requires us to respect others and to treat others as their position demands and as our relationship to them demands, whether they are our superiors, our inferiors, or our equals. So when we hear this, the, the question arises, especially in our American minds, wait a minute, does that mean that in the sight of God, there exist these categories of superiors and inferiors and equals? And the answer is yes. The terms father and mother in the commandment indicate those who are superior in their gifts from God, whether it be in the realm of age or office or ability. Uh, these are our parents. These are our older siblings or aunts or uncles or even cousins and others who are our superiors in age. These are our employers, our police and government officials, those whose office is superior to ours. And it includes those whose abilities are superior to ours as well. The fifth commandment requires, it teaches that we are to preserve their honor and to perform the duties that belong to us in regard to these, our superiors. The term inferiors, on the other hand, indicates that there are those who must subject themselves to the authority of others. And the term equals indicates, obviously, that there are those that are equal in ability or age or place or dignity. Now, with the possible exception of the youngest baby among us, it's safe to say that all of us are superiors, inferiors, and equals in our various relationships to others in our lives. We don't believe in a, a wicked caste system where you're just born into a certain place and that's just what you are. You're only an inferior your entire life or you're only a superior. We don't believe in chattel slavery where a person is told that they're only an inferior. And here in America, we don't believe in the divine right of kings uh, and the like where someone is only a superior and they can do whatever they want. We're all superiors and inferiors and equals in our various stations and relationships in life and we're to perform the duties that are owed in these various relationships as unto God. Now this extends from parents and children to husbands and wives to employers and employees to, as I said already, government officials and citizens to our elders and minister in the congregation, older and younger, and on and on. We don't necessarily like this language of inferiors and superiors. We want to all be equals, right? But that isn't the way that the world is set up, and we know it. So, what are the duties that we, as inferiors, owe to our superiors? And you can think of these answers as children and parents, if you like. It certainly applies there. And to some degree, as we've seen, it applies in our relationship to our superiors and other stations in life as well. So, inferiors, or children, are to honor our superiors or parents both inwardly and outwardly not just with the mouth to avoid the lash but we should strive to honor our superiors from the heart now if they are dishonorable superiors we're to honor God by honoring them both inwardly and outwardly and sometimes that's the only way we can do it Lord I'm, I'm going to obey you by obeying this person who you have placed as my superior. How specifically? Well, we're to listen to their instructions. We're to obey their commands. We're to meekly accept their reproofs and their correction. We're to love them and we're to care for them when it's necessary. 
This is what it means to honor our father and mother and our superiors in our life so that our days may be long upon the land which the Lord our God giveth us. Now, what are the duties that parents or superiors owe to our children or our inferiors in our various stations in life? Well, we're to love them and to care for them. We're to train them in the knowledge of the scriptures. We're to pray for them and to keep them under subjection, to encourage them with kindness and reproof and to prepare them for the future. Do your parents or your superiors at work uh, do all of these things? If they do, you're, you're blessed. And if they don't, do we still owe them our honor? Yes, we do. We, we clearly do. Now, do they have carte blanche? Do they have a, a blank check, total freedom to command us to do anything under the sun, and we have to obey it no matter what? Do we owe them our obedience? Yes. To what degree? Or rather, what rule is there to measure the degree of obedience and submission that we owe to our parents and to our other superiors? Well, that rule is none other than the law of God. So whenever anything is commanded of us that is contrary to God's moral law, then the fixed rule is what Peter and John told the council in Acts chapter 4 and 5. We ought to obey God rather than man. So we cannot be commanded to break God's moral law. God's law, uh, God created and exists by the rule of non-contradiction. So he's not going to command us to do this and command us to do the opposite over here. God's law will always be over the, the uh, authority that we owe to men. Um, as always, there's a lot to think about here as the, as the moral law is broadened out week by week and shows us every area of our lives and what we are to owe to God. I've not done a good job of this, but I do intend going forward to remind us often that there has only ever been one man who has perfectly kept the Ten Commandments and during whose entire life never failed for even one moment to love the Lord his God, his Father, with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength, and his neighbor as himself. And our hope this morning is in the true and better Adam, the fulfillment of the law that we've just sung about, the Lord Jesus Christ, and his obedience in our place. So let's say questions 63 and 64 together. I'll read the questions and then you guys can say the, uh, the answers with us. So back to 63, which is the fifth commandment? The fifth commandment is, Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. And question 64, what is required in the fifth commandment? The fifth commandment requireth the preserving the honor and performing the duties belonging to everyone in their several places and relations as superiors, inferiors, or equals. As we go to the Lord in prayer uh, this morning, uh, again, we are reminded that we are sinners uh, and we break God's law um, by what we do and what we don't do, but what we say and what we don't say, uh, by our thought process. Uh, and so we are thankful that there is one who has uh, never broken God's law, who, uh, who dresses us with his righteousness this morning. We do have several prayer requests, praise items. Um, Angie Taylor's father uh, died this, uh, this past week. Uh, they will be having a private ceremony, uh, and, and yet we want, to, uh, we want to pray for Angie and, and their family in their grief. Also, as many of you know, uh, Nancy Knight, Sam's mom, uh, fell uh, yesterday. Uh, and she has broken some bones around her eye. Uh, but being Nancy, she's back home and, uh, and doing fine, uh, other than she is very, very sore uh, and is, uh, is hurting. Uh, but we want to just thank God that, uh, that God protected her and Sam, who both fell together, uh, down some steps. So I uh, just want to thank God for his mercy to them. 
Uh, we also want to praise God for little Easton, who is home from the hospital uh, after a short stay in the hospital. We want to pray for God's continued uh, healing and strengthening of him. Uh, and we want to continue to pray for Peggy uh, and, and the continued care that she has in the nursing facility uh, where she is. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. And I want to encourage us from, uh, again, some familiar verses uh, from uh, Romans chapter 7, uh, Paul's confession of his sinfulness and his hope in Christ. So uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am of flesh, sold into bondage to sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For I am not practicing what I would like to do, but I am doing the very thing I hate. But if I do the very thing I do not want to do, I agree with the law, confessing that the law was good. So now no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. For the good that I want, I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not want. But if I'm doing the very thing that I do not want, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. I find then the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good. For I joyfully concur with the law of God in my inner man, but I see a different law in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other with my flesh, the law of sin. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. God, once again, we agree with Paul that, that the, the, the desire to please you is, is in us, but the doing of it is not. Uh, that there is a part of us, and sometimes a very small part of us, that wants to do right. But we are, we are slaves to sin. And yet, thanks be to God... For Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who has set us free from the law of sin and death. And so, God, we confess, I confess for myself and for our church family here that we are sinners. We are sinners by nature. We are sinners in our core. And so, God, we come to you again. We thank you and praise you that there is no condemnation for us that are in Christ because of Christ, because of your gracious work of redemption in our lives. And so, God, I, I pray for my, myself and for my brothers and sisters here that we would once again uh, experience your forgiveness and cleansing. God, I pray that you would cause us to rejoice uh, in Christ and in the forgiveness that is ours because of Christ. And so, God, we thank you. God, we do want to pray for Angie's family today and just pray that you would be a comfort to them and a strength to them. God, I pray that, um, that, you, would, uh, that you would cause them to, to rejoice uh, in uh, the sure hope of eternal life in Christ. And, and God, we just ask for your comfort for their family. God, we do pray for Miss Nancy and just ask that you would uh, continue to strengthen her and heal her even today. I pray she could rest well. Um, I pray you would ease her pain. Um, God, I thank you for sparing her from worse injury, she and Sam both. And um, we just thank you for your mercy uh, there. God, we thank you for your mercy and grace to, to little Easton and, and to his family. God, I thank you that he can be home from the hospital. And I pray you'd protect him from further illness and God I pray you would strengthen him and 
and, and, uh, and just be healing him and developing him. I pray you'd be an encouragement to his family in this. Um, God, I pray that uh, for Anna Reese and just ask that um, this recent uh, heart procedure she had would, uh, would be successful, God. I pray that you would, again, be strengthening her also. God, we do thank you for the good care that Peggy is receiving, and, and we just ask that you would continue to be merciful to her. And um, God, I just pray that uh, you would draw her attention, her thoughts to you, and your great love for her in Christ. Uh, and again, we pray for her family, that you would be an encouragement uh, to them. God, we thank you for this church family. We thank you for this small part of the body of Christ that you have drawn us to, that you have drawn us together. Uh, and God, I pray that we would worship you in ways that we can't individually. And God, I pray that you would cause us to, to love each other uh, and, and to love you. And God, I pray that you would use us as a light set right here, that you would draw many of your chosen ones to yourself uh, through what you're doing in and through us uh, as a church. God, we, we bring these requests to you because you invite us to. Um, because you call us to, uh, and we thank you for being uh, a good and gracious and loving Father. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As we continue to worship, I'd invite you to stand as we sing hymn 273, Depth of Mercy Can There Be. Again, for while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us.
I would invite you to turn with me to Acts chapter 10. The scripture reading this morning is Acts chapter 10, verses 1 through 23. Acts chapter 10, starting in verse 1. Now, there was a man of Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian cohort, a devout man, one who feared God with all his household and gave many alms to the Jewish people and prayed to God continually. About the ninth hour of the day, he clearly saw in a vision an angel of God who had just come in and said to him, Cornelius, and fixing his gaze on him and being much alarmed, he said, What is it, Lord? And he said to him, Your prayers and alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Now dispatch some men to Joppa to send for a man named Simon, who is also called Peter. He is staying with a tanner named Simon, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who was speaking to him had left, he summoned two of his servants and a devout soldier of those who were his personal attendants. And after he had explained everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. On the next day, as they were On their way and approaching the city, Peter went up to the housetop about the sixth hour to pray. But he became hungry and was desiring to eat. But while they were making preparations, he fell into a trance. And he saw the sky opened up and an object like a great sheet coming down, lowered by four corners to the ground. And there were in it all kinds of four-footed animals and crawling creatures of the earth and birds of the air. And a voice came to him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, by no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything unholy and unclean. And again, a voice came to him a second time, what God has cleansed, no longer consider unholy. This happened three times and immediately the object was taken up into the sky. Now, while Peter was greatly perplexed in mind as to what the vision which he had seen might be, behold, the men who had been sent by Cornelius, having asked directions for Simon's house, appeared at the gate. And calling out, they were asking whether Simon, who was also called Peter, was staying there. While Peter was reflecting on the vision, the spirit said to him, behold, three men are looking for you, but get up, go downstairs And accompany them without misgivings, for I have sent them myself. Peter went down to the men and said, Behold, I am the one you are looking for. What is the reason for which you have come? And they said, Cornelius, a centurion, a righteous and God-fearing man, well spoken of by the entire nation of the Jews, was divinely directed by a holy angel to send for you, to come to his house, and hear a message from you. So he invited them in and gave them lodging. Let's pray. God, I pray that you would teach us from this section of your word. God, I pray that um, that you would use this time in our lives. God, I pray that uh, that you would Again, direct our, our thoughts and our, our hearts to, to, to worship you. Um, God, I pray you would help us to see what you have done uh, in the lives of your people. And I pray you would encourage us today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> in Jesus' ministry, in, in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus was discussing with his disciples and he asked the question, Who do people say the Son of Man is? Who do people say the Son of Man is? The Son of Man is a messianic title from the Old Testament. Who do people say the Messiah? Who do people say the the Son of Man is? And they answered and said, well, some say John the Baptist. And some say Elijah or Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And then Jesus turned to them in Matthew 16, verse 15, and said, But who do you say I am? So notice what Jesus just said right there. Who do, what's everybody saying about the Son of Man? And they're like, well, some people say 
John the Baptist. Some people say Elijah. And he said, yeah, yeah, but who do you say I am? And so Jesus right there claims the messianic title of the Son of Man. And Simon Peter answers for the, the, the disciples, as he often did, right or wrong, he answered for the disciples. And Simon Peter this time says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus responded to him and said, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven revealed this to you. And then in the next verse he says, I say to you, that you are Peter, and upon this Petra, I say to you that you are little stone, and upon this great rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not stand against my church. Jesus' promise is based on the truth that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God. He is going to build his church. I will build my church. In First Peter, Chapter 2, verse 5, Peter says, We, believers, are as living stones. We are being built up into a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. He is building us into his church, into his temple. In Romans chapter 8, familiar verses uh, in verse 28 through verse 30, we know that God causes all things to work together for good for those who love God, for those who are called according to his purpose, for those whom he foreknew he predestined to become conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. Whom he predestined, he called, and these whom he called, he also justified, and these whom he justified, he has also glorified. God is working. God is calling his people to himself. He is building his church. He is building his house. He is building his temple. Here in the book of Acts, chapter 10, we see another example of this, of God working to bring to himself one of his chosen ones. In chapter 10, verse 1, there was a man of Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion of what is called the Italian cohort. He was in Caesarea. Caesarea was the town that Philip headed to back in chapter 8, verse 40, when he left the Ethiopian eunuch. When he leaves the eunuch, he goes to Caesarea. Again, an example of God working. Philip was already in that city. This man is a centurion. He is a Roman officer in charge of at least 100, possibly up to 600 men. He is one of 10 centurions in this Italian cohort. He is in charge of, was in charge of protecting the Roman governor in Caesarea. And we're told here that in verse 2, he was a devout man. One who feared God with all his household and gave many alms to the Jewish people and prayed to God continually. He was a devout man. He was pious. He was religious. He was devoted. He was what was called a God-fearer. He was a Gentile who was participating in and observed at least some of the Jewish faith practices. He gave many alms to the Jewish people. We're told in Scripture that alms were acts of charity, and Jesus himself considered them acts of worship to God. And so he gave, he gave alms, he gave gifts of charity to the Jewish people, and he prayed to God continually. He called out to God. Now, the first thing I want us to see, several things I want us to see right here. This is evidence of God working in him. Y'all want you to understand this is not a lesson where boys and girls be more, like, be more like Cornelius. Cornelius was lost. Cornelius was a sinner like you and I. Right? And the evidence of God working in him we see here. God, God is in the process of drawing Cornelius to himself. Again, Romans 3 verses 10 through 18 clearly says that in each of us, in and of ourselves, there is no one who fears God. There is no one good. There's no one righteous. There's no one who seeks for God. There's no one who calls out to God. In and of ourselves, 
We do not do any of those things. So the fact that he is marked by some of these things is evidence of God beginning a work in him, of God calling him to himself. Cornelius is what we would call a good guy. He is a devout man. He was a good man. And there are lots and lots and lots and lots of good folks that are not believers, that are not in Christ, that don't know the Lord. John 3, verse 1, Jesus is dealing with a good, good man named Nicodemus would certainly be uh, an indication. We're told in John chapter 3, verse 1, that Nicodemus was a man of the Pharisees, a ruler of the Jews. He was a man of the Pharisees. He had memorized Scripture. He had memorized the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. He would have all five of those books memorized. He went to the temple as a good Pharisee every single time the temple was open. If he lived in Jerusalem, which he did, he would have gone to the temple 35 hours every week. He would have fasted two days a week. He would have spent those days in prayer, not eating, because the 35 hours a week at church were not enough. That was a good, good, religious, devout man. And Jesus said to him, you must be born again if you would see the kingdom of God. Why? Because he was good. He was good. He was religious. He was, it, 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 compared to other folks, he was righteous and he was lost until God drew him to himself through Jesus Christ. He needed Christ. This is a good man. Cornelius is a, a man that God is drawing to himself. And so we have this, this, this devout righteous, lost guy. And so in verses 3 and following, we see this vision. Now you talk about God working to draw somebody to himself. Cornelius has a, a vision about the ninth hour of the day. He clearly saw in a vision an angel of God who had just come in and said to him, Cornelius, and fixing his eyes on him, being much alarmed, he said, what is it, Lord? And he said to him, your prayers and alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Dispatch some men to Joppa. Send for a man named Simon, who is also called Peter. He is staying with a tanner named Simon, whose house is by the sea. Some encouraging things here. First of all, notice the gospel goes out through humans. The angel here does not declare the good news of Jesus Christ to Cornelius. He declares to Cornelius how to go find a guy that will share the gospel with him. In, in Scripture, God occasionally and rarely and usually to non-believers speaks through dreams or speaks through visions. Man, in the Old Testament, he was constantly leading pagan kings, Pharaoh for one, Nebuchadnezzar for another, Cyrus for another, through dreams or visions. And God rarely, sometimes, occasionally, would speak through an angelic announcement. God most commonly speaks through his written word. God most commonly calls his people to himself through the written word and through a person sharing and explaining the truth of the written word of God. So what God does here is he sends an angel to tell this man how to find a man that will share the good news with him. Does God still miraculously supernaturally speak to people? Possibly. And I think there are places in the world where he does. God most commonly uses folks just like us to draw his chosen ones to himself. Second thing here that would have been, I think, very encouraging to Cornelius. We're told here, he's told through this this, this angel that he's, he's looking for a man called Simon Peter who's staying with another guy, guy named Simon who was a tanner. We're told here twice in this, in this passage that Simon Peter was staying with a tanner named Simon. Tanning was, the tanning of, of, of skins was considered unclean work and it was considered unclean work, listen, because it was. 
It, it was. I, uh, I don't know if you've ever been around much tanning going on. I was actually talking with my brother-in-law, Gary, uh, this past week, and he was talking about being in Morocco. And I, we actually asked him, what was, the, what was the coolest thing you saw? And he said, well, the, the most vivid thing I saw was I was actually taken to a, a tannery. And he said, you know, the, the streets are about this wide, and it's, they're crowded, and he said, I was walking in, and there's people pushing, and all of a sudden there was a mule carrying skinned carcasses coming out, and he said, it actually rubbed against me as it went by, and so that was the first sensory uh, experience I had. And then he said, you go, you go in, and it was, it, the, the smell is, is so strong, and there's so much, he said, it, it, it was nauseating, he said, that was by far the, the most memorable experience. That was tanning, and it was, considered, it was considered physically unclean because it was. And it was considered ritually unclean because they were constantly handling dead animals, and therefore anyone that was a tanner was constantly ritually unclean. Anybody that came into physical contact with them was ritually unclean. He had to live by the sea. Do you notice it says he lived down by the sea? That's because that's where they had to live. You had to, wherever you lived, you had to, your, your house had to be a half mile out of town, and it had to be downwind from the town. We want you to live downwind because, have you ever been around somebody, I don't know, that, that did something that had an odor, and then after you were around them for a while, somebody thought you had been involved in that thing? Because now you, if you stayed with them, you were going to smell obvious that God is working in Simon Peter, this good, righteous disciple, this good Jew that would never have been caught dead staying with a tanner. And here Simon Peter is staying with this, this tanner named Simon. Now, what an encouragement to Cornelius, because Cornelius, as a good God-fearer, a Roman who was involved in Jewish practices, he would have known, number one, that, that there's no way Simon Peter's ever going to come as a good Jew to a house of a Roman, and neither would he ever go to the house of a tanner. And so possibly, if he's willing to stay with a tanner, he'll come to my house. Possibly... Possibly God has done something here that if he's willing to stay here and stink like that, he'll come over here and stink a different way. Maybe he'll come and be willing to, to, to do whatever this angel is instructing us. May God in his mercy and grace to us work in us and soften our hearts towards unclean folks. There are so many folks in our society that if you're like me, whether you want to or not, you look down on them. At least I'm not like so-and-so. I might do this, but I would never do that. I might be heavily involved in this, which I know is wrong, but you know I would never do that. May God in his mercy use us to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with those that are far off. Or possibly what we're seeing here. Notice what, notice what, what the, the angel says to, 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 to Cornelius, verse 4. He says, what is it, Lord? And the angel spoke and said, your prayers and alms have ascended as a memorial before God. This is not a lesson to learn to pray like Cornelius. Because again, this is, I think what this verse shows us is God's mercy to Cornelius. Your prayers and alms have ascended to God as a, a memorial, as a sacrifice. Isaiah 64, 6 says, our righteousness is as filthy rags to God. We are an unclean thing to him. Again, Romans 3, there's nobody who seeks for God. There's nobody good. There's nobody righteous. There's nobody acceptable to God. So what's this angel saying? God has chosen to accept your unacceptable worship. God has chosen to be pleased with you, Cornelius, even though in your best efforts, you're not pleasing. We saw that in, in Genesis 15 when it says, Abraham believed the Lord and God credited it to him as righteousness. God recorded it as if it was righteousness. Abraham, for one verse, believed what God said. The very next verse, he disbelieves God. But for one verse, he believed God. 
He had faith in what, in what the Lord had said. And we're told in Scripture that, that faith is a gift from God. So God gave him the gift of faith. And Abraham expressed that gift. And God took the gift that he had given and credited it to him as if it was his righteousness. What a great example of God's mercy here to this man. What a great example of God's mercy to us that he would ever hear our prayers. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. Have you ever been praying silently, maybe laying in bed? Have you ever been laying in bed, praying, and started thinking about something else completely? Have you ever done that? Let's try this. Have you ever been praying and falling asleep in the middle of your prayers? Have you ever been doing that? You ever been praying, going? I'm not going to ask for any of you. Have you ever been praying? I said no raising of hands. Stop it. Have you ever been praying and actually thought about something you probably shouldn't have been thinking about? In the middle of your prayer and you thought, oh, God, please, whoo. There's nothing acceptable about us other than Christ in us and Christ covering us. Your prayers, Cornelius, have ascended to the Lord. So verse 7 and 8, Cornelius sends three guys to Joppa for Peter. He sends two of his servants. The word therefore there is two of his slaves, two of his slaves, and a devout soldier who would have been a Roman, an Italian, a Roman, and he sends them to Joppa. Now, as they're being sent, Peter has this vision. And we, we know about this vision. As the three men are approaching the next day, verse 9, as they're approaching the city, Peter goes up on the housetop about noon to pray. And as he was praying, he becomes hungry. And so somebody in the house is preparing the food. And while he's prepared, they're preparing the food, he falls into a trance. And he has this, this vision of this sheet coming down out of heaven, and it's held up by the corners, and it's got all these animals in it. It's got all these animals in it. And here he is, he's hungry, and, and so God uses this vision, and God says to, to, to Peter, and he hears, he hears the voice, and a voice said, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Get up, Peter, kill and eat. You're hungry, eat some of this meat. Verse 14, and he said, no, Lord. Let's just stop right there. That's what's called a contradiction of terms. No, sovereign God and ruler of the universe, no. No one who's in control of all things, no. I will not do this. I have never eaten what is unholy. I have never eaten what is unclean. And the voice came to him a second time, verse 15, and said, What God has cleansed, no longer consider unholy. The literal there is, what God has made clean, no longer do not continue making unclean. If God has made someone clean, don't you dare consider them unclean or, uh, or common or profane, or vulgar. This happens three times. This happens three times. Now, it actually says, and the vision happened three times, which encourages me again about Peter. God gives him a direct command, and, God, and, and Peter says no. So God does the whole thing again and gives him a direct command, and Peter says no. And God does See, if I was God, I would have killed Peter. If I, was, if, I was, if I was God, I would have killed Cain, for sure. If I was God... And three, you talk about God's mercy to a stubborn follower of his. A lot of commentators I've read actually, actually have some evidence to think that this voice that he heard was the voice of Jesus. It was actually Jesus Christ speaking, a voice that he would have heard and recognized, a voice that he would have recognized. And finally, it says on the third time, Peter is, is, is trying to, to understand what this vision meant. That this vision that, that what, God calls unclean, God, what God calls clean, don't you call unclean. That, that, that the ones that the, the sun sets free are free indeed. Don't call them. And he's trying to figure out what this means. And while he's trying to figure it out, it says the, the men came and, and, and appeared at his house. And, and appeared at the gate, and they were calling out, asking whether Simon, who was also called Peter, was there. You know, this should encourage us about God's timing. This should encourage us about God's timing. God's timing is perfect. He's trying to figure out, what does the sheet vision mean? 
And suddenly there's three guys, and just in case Peter can't figure out what the sheet vision meant, then the Spirit said to him, there are three men outside looking for you. Go downstairs and accompany them without misgiving. I have sent them myself. I have sent them to you. Again, God's mercy. Peter asked him, verse 21, why are you here? Why have you come? And they said, Cornelius, a centurion, a God-fearer, was divinely directed by an angel to send for you. We need to hear a message. He needs to hear a message from you. Peter's response, verse 23, he invited the men and gave them lodging. Come on in, eat, stay with us. Two slaves and a Roman soldier. Come in and stay with me. Hey, guys, come on in. Two slaves and a Roman soldier. What evidence of God working in Peter? We're going to look at the message that Peter shares because God instructed him to share it in next week's lesson. But some applications for us today. I think, I think this passage calls us to step outside the circles that we're comfortable with. Y'all, the circles that I'm comfortable with look a lot like me. They're short and old. Or actually, they look a lot like you. The, the, the folks I'm comfortable with look like you. And they dress like you guys. The, the, the young people that I'm comfortable with are interested in sports. I don't understand kids that aren't interested in sports. Well, what's wrong with you? The folks that I'm comfortable with listen to the right kind of music, and they don't listen to the wrong kind of music, because if you listen to the wrong kind of music, there's something wrong with you. The people that I'm comfortable with vote like me and honor people that vote like me. And possibly what God's calling us to here is to step beyond our pride and our prejudices, our social and economic and education and denomination and national and age and gender and race prejudices. Possibly what he's doing is calling us to share Christ. Possibly you can, you can think of somebody already that is in your circle of, of, of contact and yet not in your circle of, of acquaintances or friends because they are so different. Possibly God is calling me and you to share Christ with somebody we're already, we already have contact with. Or possibly he's just calling us in general to share Christ here and around the world. <clears throat> and as he calls us to those things, be encouraged that God is working and God is calling his chosen ones to himself. And God, in his mercy, allows us to be involved in what he's doing. We are going to win. He is going to build his church. The church is going to last forever. His church is going to last forever. The temple that he's building is going to last forever. And he's allowing us to be a part of that and a part of building that and a part of sharing Christ and drawing his chosen ones to himself and be encouraged God's timing is perfect and it seems that he will bring them to us and he will bring us to them and God will use us by his grace and his mercy in other people's lives let's pray God I thank you for Cornelius <clears throat> I thank you for the way you have worked the way you worked in this man's life the, the miraculous things you did to draw this man to yourself and God, I pray as we continue to look at your grace and mercy to him over the next couple of weeks, God, I pray that you would encourage us and that we would again see your grace and your mercy and your great work of salvation in our lives. And God, I thank you that you call us just like you called Peter, just like you called the, the 11, to, to be your witnesses, to, uh, to go and make disciples of all nations. Uh, and God, I pray that you would give us eyes to see the opportunities around us. And God, again, I thank you that we can trust you, that you're sovereign, and that you're going to call your people, your sons and daughters, to yourself. And again, I thank you for giving us the joy of being a part of that. I thank you for the people you've already used in our lives to draw us to Christ. 
God, we praise you this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. As we continue to worship this morning, I'd invite you to stand. We're going to sing hymn 275, Amazing Grace. My, my, my joy, my honor to, to pronounce a benediction, a blessing on you from our God and the Father who calls us to himself through Jesus Christ while we were still his sinners. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. Amen. Mm -hmm.